So good morning, colleagues, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Linda Bald. Welcome to the Usher COVID webinar series. Um, I'm a professor of public health in the Usher Institute, and um, this is one of, of many that we've run since March. Um, and I'm just going to take you through the, uh, the way we run these webinars for those of you who might be joining for the first time, and then I will introduce the topic and the speakers. Um, so we can't see you, those of you attending via Zoom. We've also got people watching uh, on the live stream on YouTube. Those of you that have registered on Zoom, you're able to post questions via the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box, which is the one beside it. So please do pop some questions in there as soon as you think of them. And then at the end, I'll be posing a selection of the questions, uh, depending on how much time we have, uh, to the speakers. Um, and the webinar is being recorded. And just a reminder that after the session, we will be posting a PDF of the slides on the Usher website and also a link uh, to the YouTube stream. So um, please do disseminate that afterwards and encourage others to watch. So I'm really delighted that um, again in this series, we're bringing together um, health improvement as well as health protection issues. So we're talking here about the role of physical activity in prevention and recovery. From COVID-19 and the measures introduced to address the pandemic. And we've got a really excellent uh, range of four speakers, collaborators. Professor Nani Muchi, who many of you will go know, who's the uh, Director of the Physical Activity for Health Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh. Also Dr Paul Kelly from the same research centre here in Edinburgh and their collaborator, Professor Sebastian Shasta, who's a Senior Research Fellow uh, in Physiotherapy in the Department of Physiotherapy and Paramedicine at Glasgow Caledonian University and also Ghent University. And Dr Claire Fitzsimmons, who's a lecturer in Physical Activity for Health in the Physical Activity for Health Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh. So we're going to have uh, presentations in succession with no breaks in between from each of these speakers and then we'll have questions at the end. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Nanette who's going to say some introductory remarks and also take you through uh, what will be covered. Thanks very much Nanette. Thank you very much indeed Linda for uh, the organisation and, and for hosting this topic for us this morning. I'm going to do a very brief introduction and I'll share my screen to do that. So the four speakers are going to run in order, myself giving a brief introduction to the whole topic, our colleague Seb doing 10 minutes on immune function, Paul doing 10 minutes on the broader areas of physical activity, and Claire doing 10 minutes, focusing more on sedentary behaviour. And we're hoping then to be able to leave 20 minutes for questions and discussion. A small bit about our research centre here in Edinburgh. Our aim is to develop and test and to implement interventions which encourage people of all ages to sit less and move more. Our particular themes are focused on walking and cycling promotion, uh, the investigation of sedentary behaviour, physical activity amongst key at-risk populations, such as those with chronic disease. We also focus on measurement and surveillance, more recently on the communication of key messages around physical activity and evaluation of projects. Along the bottom, you have some of the things we're currently involved with. For example, we've been helping create an infographic with Public Health Scotland about being active during COVID-19. We're working with both British Cycling and Cycling Scotland on various ways of promoting cycling. We're helping evaluate the 20 mile an hour zones in, in various cities. And we work closely with Pass for All and the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network. So along the bottom also, you will see our web page where you can email us and how to follow us on Twitter if you'd like to do that. Now, the background to this topic is that physical activity has considerable evidence now that it can prevent and treat most non-communicable diseases. That has been the mantra over the last two decades. An example of where you can find that evidence is in the US Surgeon General's report of 2018, and the web link should take you there. In addition, the WHO Global Plan focuses on 
non-communicable diseases and in reducing physical inactivity. And that is one of the nine targets set for 2013 to 2020. So if you can see the global targets now on this slide, we have um, things that we could change in the blue boxes. In the black box at the top is the goal of reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases by 25% by 2025. And in the blue uh, circles going around the side, you see some of the things that you, you have maybe discussed already in the Usher webinars, reduction of alcohol. And here we have reduction of physical inactivity by 10% by 2025. And then some other obvious items, reduction in salt, tobacco use, reducing blood pressure and keeping diabetes and obesity at a zero increase. So we are very much part of WHO's plan to reduce non-communicable diseases. And what is it we're talking about when we say inactivity? Well, this infographic comes from the latest Chief Medical Officer's guidelines about the recommended levels of activity for health. Now, right up at the top, we see all the benefits of activity and Paul will deal with that in more detail. And you can see little mantras. Some is good, more is better. Make a start today, it's never too late. Every minute counts. And in the middle, we've got some of the important ingredients. What are we aiming for? At least 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity. Or if you're able to do more vigorous levels of activity, it's less time, 75 minutes, perhaps a combination of both. Importantly, we've got building strength right in the middle of this, sometimes a forgotten aspect of the physical activity for health recommendations at least twice a week. Then we have minimizing sedentary time and Claire will deal with that in more detail and improving balance, particularly for older adults. But also to put us into the global picture of physical activity, we're very much part of the sustainable goal development uh, for, for the world. And this is um, a picture of the 17 sustainable development goals. And at an, a conference meeting of the International Society of Physical Activity for Health, they picked out eight in which physical activity can play a very strong role. Of course, right in the middle, number three is the improvement of good health and well-being. But you can see the others round the, the pie chart there. We can play our part in quality education, in gender equity, in reduced inequalities, in sustainable cities and communities, in climate action, on life in the land, and for peace and justice. So bringing us back to today uh, and our topic, what has been less well known, I would say up until now, is the role not only in non-communicable diseases, but the role in communicable diseases such as COVID viruses. And Seb's work on this, I believe is a game changer for the importance of physical activity for health in this current world crisis. Now, the importance of physical activity for mental and physical health during the lockdown was emphasized by all the chief medical officers of the UK, saying that one reason to leave our house was to exercise. And we've never had that level of political or government support for giving people a good reason to exercise. Now, having said that, some people may benefit from increased physical activity during COVID restrictions, but others will find that difficult to do. And we fear this might lead to further health inequalities. And Paul is going to address that particular issue. And then an overlooked aspect of the guidelines for physical activity during our COVID world is the recommendation to minimize sitting time. And Claire is going to help us understand that aspect as we go through our webinar this morning. So that gives you the running order and the background, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Seb. Thank you, Nanette. Okay, over to you, Seb. That was excellent, thanks.
Good morning, all. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I would like to thank Nanette and Linda for inviting me. So I'm going to talk you through the recent research we did on the relationship between um, physical activity and the immune system. Uh, <clears throat> as can you all see my screen? I can't see your screen yet. Seb. we can just see your your picture. So if you if you can, you may have if if you've got two screens, you may need to select the other one. Yeah. Can you see it now? No, it's still you that we see. I know how this is so frustrating when this happens. I have the same problem. Um, you try one more time, and if not, we'll get to uh, ask Lorna to bring those up. This is strange. Um, do, 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 if I just switch off my video, maybe. No, it's just. This is a blank screen now. Do you want Lorna to bring them up? Would that be helpful? Uh, give me a, just a second. I'll try one more time. No problem. Oh, here we go. This is starting. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Perfect. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Um, so as Nanette said, we, we've known for quite some time that physical activity has a relationship with non-communicable diseases. And we, all governments and international organizations have published guidelines about how we should be active to prevent non-communicable diseases. And interestingly, I was in Geneva at the World Health Organization as part of the committee that was updating the World Health Organization um, guidelines uh, right in February where, when the pandemic uh, of COVID started and we were surrounded by um, TV cameras and people debating this. And in our committee, none of us actually considered the, the relationship between physical activity and communicable diseases at all. And in the back of my mind, I was like, what is the evidence um, that physical activity might be a, a, a protective against, against uh, communicable diseases? Um, <clears throat> and very quickly, when the pandemic and lockdown happened, uh, the World Health Organization, several governments, as Nanette said, encourage strongly people to be active. And there was a, a lot of debate around whether we should keep parks open to allow people to be outside and exercising. And we have seen there's an emerging literature around the fact that people have increasingly been uh, interested in physical activity as a result of lockdown. There's some research, uh, we don't have pure data about how much more people have been active, but there are research, for example, on um, such as done by Melody Ding, on how much people have done research on the internet about being physically active, what kind of training they can do. And our colleagues from Australia were telling me that actually at the end of lockdown in Sydney, the, uh, the street were littered uh, with discarded home exercise equipment. So this message and this political support, as Nanette said, has probably had a real effect on people engaging with physical activity. And scientists uh, being stuck at home themselves and not being able to do their normal research, they also taken to their computers and to writing pieces about how important it is for, to be physically active in the, during the pandemic and maybe to uh, prevent um, uh, or reduce the rate of infection. But what is the evidence behind this? And most of these opinion pieces are not very clear about this. So when we go back, is there some evidence that we already have? Actually, probably yes, because the, the foundation of the guidelines, this is, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 fact, the, the evidence behind the American guidelines that were published last year about physical activity are based on epidemiological research. And this is, most of it is on all cause mortality. Uh, and there is a clear dose response between physical activity levels and all cause mortality. And that all cause mortality necessarily um, includes some mortality due to infectious disease. So although we've never interpreted it as such, there must be some, some protective effect of physical activity uh, in, with respect to communicable diseases because that's included in this, those response somehow. So 
what would be the mechanism, although we don't know precisely, that's the orange uh, arrow here, the relationship between physical activity and infectious disease risk and mortality, uh, <clears throat> the, it must be there somehow. And what would be the mechanism? Well, we know some of them already, some of the possible pathways that have been hypothesized. We know that physical activity reduces the risk of communicable disease in chronic conditions which we know are themselves risk uh, with uh, infectious disease. And it's been demonstrated for COVID that people that have diabetes or obesity are probably more at risk. We also know that physical activity reduces stress, which in turn reduces chronic inflammation. And then therefore in turn makes us less uh, susceptible to uh, infectious disease. But what we, don't know very well is the more direct pathway, which is how does the physical, does physical activity changes our immune function and then therefore prevents uh, us catching infectious disease. And if we do, uh, are we more at risk of dying of this infectious disease? So this is the reason why very sh shortly after coming back from Geneva, I put an international team together and I wanted to make sure that my colleagues are um, acknowledged here to try to uh, summarize the evidence around the relationship between physical activity, uh, the risk of um, <clears throat> the risk of uh, community acquired infectious disease and subsequent mortality, uh, and try to understand what how physical activity impacts markers of immune functions, and finally trying to understand if physical activity could play a role in a vaccination campaign. And this really much with the, uh, the aim to inform uh, governments and instances uh, that, and policy makers. So to provide them the evidence to really support this uh, really strong and, and nice uh, political will to encourage physical activity during the pandemic. Uh, I have a proviso because what I'm going to show you and share with you today, the results are not peer reviewed at the moment. Uh, we worked incredibly fast and efficiently. We started this meta analysis uh, uh, in April and we managed to finish this in, in early June. And we shared it with uh, the World Health Organization and, and, and all the governments and governmental agencies. Uh, but we then subsequently sent it to various mainstream uh, medical journals and the, we received really nice polite letters telling us that it was very interesting, but that physical activity is not a priority. So as such, the uh, results are not peer reviewed yet. So I wanted to let you know that that's the state of the evidence at the moment. So our method is a bona fide systematic review and meta-analysis following the PRISMA guidelines as close as possible to Cochrane. We pre-registered uh, the, the protocol with Prospero and we wanted to include uh, observational prospective studies, longitudinal studies and a randomized control trial that compared basically different level of physical activity in the adult population only. We excluded uh, studies on elite athletes uh, and studies that looked at the um, immediate effects. So we were more interested in the chronic effects of physical activity. So, and we searched all the possible database we could up to April, uh, 2020. And our outcome are really the markers of immune functions and risk of infectious disease. So, we screened some almost 17,000 articles. We had 600 or so uh, full text to read. We had a very broad search to make sure we didn't uh, miss anything. And we at the end ended up with 55 studies. And this broke down to seven prospective studies around the risk of infectious disease and uh, infectious disease related mortality. We found 42 randomized control trials that looked at markers of the immune function and six randomized control trials that looked at the effect of physical activity on the outcome of vaccination. So the results are as such. So if we look at the relationship between physical activity and the risk of infectious disease, these are forest plots of our results. But what we see is if so people are active 
at the level of the guidelines. So that's 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. Uh, the, uh, we see a, a decrease in the risk of, uh, or the odd ratio of, uh, of uh, or the hazard ratios, excuse me, of uh, catching infectious disease. And there's a risk around reduction of around 31%. Subsequently, if people are active at the same level, we see a, a decrease in the risk of infectious disease related mortality about 37%. So these are quite substantial. In terms of markers of the immune system, we managed to find uh, studies that looked uh, both at the innate immune system uh, cells and the uh, adaptive immune system uh, cells as well. And the results are as follow. For uh, interventions uh, that promoted physical activity, uh, they were exercise program essentially that lasted between three to five weeks uh, at the level of moderate to, uh, to uh, vigorous physical activity. And for sessions that lasted between 30 to 60 minutes per session, three to four times a week, uh, three to five times a week and for about eight weeks. And that combined strength and aerobic uh, exercise what we found is we found a, uh, that there was a decrease around 40 to 70 uh, percent uh, um, of, of, of neutrophil white blood cells. And these are really the, uh, the, the most uh, numerous white blood cells in the system that respond rapidly to any uh, challenges uh, to our body by uh, external uh, external viral bacterial attack. So looking at this, it could, it could in, say two things. It could say that, well, if we are physically active, then uh, our innate immune system is not responding as strongly. Or it could say that actually, if we are physically active, our innate system doesn't have to respond as strongly because there's something else. We, we're, not, we're not letting so many things in. And actually that's probably the scenario because what we found as well is the first line of defense, so the mucosal layer of our body, so what's in our lungs, our nostrils, our eyes, and any place where uh, things could get into our body actually was actually strengthened. We found a small uh, to medium effect size in increase in concentration of immunoglobulin uh, IgA, which is, this, this antibody that is our first line of defense. And it was 11 studies we were able to meta-analyze showing that physical activity increases uh, the, the strength of that first line of defense. We also found that there was an increase, a small increase in uh, CD4 plus uh, T cell counts. And these are really cells that, that roam around our body uh, and they are kind of the immunosurveillance cells so they are the cells that are going to tell our body, well, oh, careful, there's something that's going in, uh, let's respond to this. So that tends to tell us that physical activity actually pre-prepare our, our body to be uh, responsive uh, to any challenges from a viral or bacterial attack. So Finally, what we found is also that if you're engaged in a physical activity program that around 20 weeks long uh, and combining strength aerobic exercise uh, for about 60 minutes, three times a week at a level of uh, moderate to, uh, to vigorous uh, intensity, we also found a small to moderate uh, beneficial effect on the titers uh, of antibody after vaccination. In other words, if you're vaccinated uh, without physical activity, you have a, a lesser response than if you're vaccinated having taken part into a physical activity program beforehand. And that is quite important because if we find finally a virus, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, vaccine for COVID-19, and there is a global or a national campaign of vaccination, it would probably be a good idea to pre-prepare our population uh, to this by engaging them in more physical activity because that potentially could increase the potency of that uh, vaccination campaign. 
So our conclusion from that uh, summary of all the evidence around uh, physical activity and infectious disease is that yes, indeed, physical activity has a protective effect against infectious disease and infectious disease related mortality that seems to be substantial. Uh, that physical activity improves the immune function of the body by increasing the first line of defense in the mucosal barriers, but also uh, by its, uh, increasing uh, the level of immunosurveillance within our body. And overall, that seems to have an effect on the innate, uh, uh, innate immune system with lesser response to inf or need for, uh, for inflammation. And finally, that physical activity could potentially improve uh, the potency of vaccination campaign. That's the result of our study. Thank you very much for listening. This is my contact. And I will be very happy now to uh, pass it over to Paul that's gonna tell us more about physical activity. Thank you very much. So that was excellent. Right, over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you, Seb. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, and, and thanks also to Linda for the uh, invitation to speak to you today. So I've been asked to talk about the role of physical activity in recovery in the COVID-19 pandemic measures. And I uh, think to, the first thing to, to start when we're considering that is to remind ourselves that physical in inactivity is a leading risk factor both nationally and globally. Um, quick notes, of course, inactivity is different to sedentary behavior, which Claire will be talking about in a second. But when we talk about inactivity, um, when we combine the risk of the behavior with the prevalence of people being inactive, we see that it's comparable to smoking in terms of, a, uh, of the burden. If we look at that a different way, re recent work from Tessa Tra Strain this summer showed that four, almost 4 million deaths are prevented each year between the ages of 45 and 70 by the activity that people are already doing. And indeed, if we focus in on the United Kingdom, that translates to over 26 and a half thousand premature deaths prevented each year by existing levels of physical activity. And I think that's important to understand what we might stand to lose if physical activity levels have been adversely affected by the pandemic. Secondly, to remind ourselves of the key benefits. And as Nanette and Seb alluded to, we've known for a long time about the physical health benefits of physical activity, of being physically active. But I just wanna take a moment to uh, highlight the brain health and the mental health benefits as well, which I think are very important to the, the recovery going forward. When we see the, the specifics of that, we're talking about things like quality of life, depressive symptoms, and anxiety symptoms. And data from Sport England uh, earlier last week showed that you know, there's been a substantial spike in anxiety in, in the UK over the, the summer months. So clearly a role there for physical activity if we want to try and address that. Looking at that in a bit more detail, this is a sort of conceptual map for how physical activity helps promote uh, mental health and well-being. with the outcomes there on the right-hand side. But some really important intermediate outcomes in terms of self-perception, social connectedness, mood and emotion, and even sleep quality and self-regulation, all of which I think it's clear how important those will be if we're looking out for the well-being of the population in the coming time. So if we take the, uh, the World Health Organization definition of health, I think it's clear physical activity has a role in, in not just the physical, but also the social and the mental health benefits and the promotion of well-being, not just the prevention of ill-being or disease. So I think the, the important point there is, is to reflect on, you know, what has been the impact of COVID and how has the pandemic maybe changed the things you know, the benefits we were already receiving and what does that mean for us moving forward? And indeed, I think that's the question that I've been asked to look at today is what is the role of physical activity as we start to plot uh, the recovery and the way forward? I've broken it down into two parts when thinking about that question. 
And the first is kind of individual or person level uh, recovery. Uh, I'm not kind of an expert of the, the physiology of this. So I've rather reflected on a few questions which I think are research priorities in the immediate future. The first is that, you know, I think it's been well reported that there are different levels of, of COVID severity that people suffer. And, and indeed this idea of long COVID that Professor Greenhouse has, has been promoting. And it, it seems to me that we might need to have different physical activity strategies uh, depending on the severity of the, the symptoms and the disease that an individual may have experienced. Given the age and the demographic of people who uh, suffer, um, it seems more, more seriously from um, COVID, it might be that we're talking about physical activity, which are the activities of daily living, making a cup of tea, using the stairs, you know, quality of life stuff, rather than maybe, you know, some of the traditional things people would think of, such as, you know, running or aerobic activity, you know, cycling, something like that. Similar to what Nanette said, you know, it might be that we're really trying to help people develop their strength and their balance in reference to the, the activities of daily living point. And indeed, it might even be just talking about how do we manage and start to address deconditioning. People may have suffered as a result of long periods of being immobile or, or highly inactive. And then finally, we've known for a long time that physical activity confers uh, benefits to lung function and cardiorespiratory fitness. But given the, the impacts of COVID on you know, these, um, these things, it, it seems that we're gonna have to think quite carefully about how physical activity can be safely uh, recommended through the recovery um, uh, in terms of, uh, like I say, things like lung function and, and pulmonary fitness. Thinking to the, or, or turning to the NHS website that has the, the, recover, the COVID recovery resources, um, and it lists the symptoms, fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, breathlessness, fear and anxiety, mood and memory and concentration, all of which we know physical activity um, can convey significant benefits on. But again, you know, there's, there's clear research priorities to understand exactly how that works in the specific case of COVID. Uh, and, and pleasingly, you know, getting moving again is front and center on the NHS website. Um, and there's some really great information there about what the NHS is currently recommending in terms of recovery. Going back to the kind of early part of the summer, there was, you know, the research was coming out quickly to try and address some of these questions, uh, initially in uh, elite athletes and, and sport, but increasingly now also in terms of regular members of the population. And like I say, you know, it's a fast moving area where there are clear research priorities to help us understand how best to use physical activity uh, at the person level uh, of recovery. The second part uh, that I reflected on was the population level recovery and, and the role of physical activity at a regional or national level. There are questions again here, how have activity levels changed? Have they gone down? Have we lost some of the existing benefits? And how have patterns changed? You know, have we lost lots of things like gym going and social physical activities and um, sports clubs um, and a lot more kind of individual in the home, Joe Wicks, that sort of thing. And, and what's the implication there for us in terms of uh, give, providing a population level strategy? As Nanette mentioned, have inequalities increased? Have people who live near pleasant green space and who have large houses with additional rooms found it much easier to adapt their physical activity than people who, for example, live in high rise flats. And again, what's the implication there? You know, are we able to give meaningful recommendations to people or, or things that just make no sense to them in terms of their lived experience? Given the clear implications on loneliness and isolation, is it that we're trying to plot uh, a population strategy that specifically addresses these, um, these outcomes in a way that is still compatible with um, COVID um, regulations and um, measures to, to prevent spread and infection. Certainly in Scotland, we've got really strong policy on the local economy and the local community. And does physical activity have a role to play there in terms of encouraging short journeys, walking and cycling in our local areas to replace longer car journeys to more out of town areas? And active travel has long been a pillar of physical activity promotion. 
Um, but now with changes to working from home and people's patterns, do we have to rethink the way that, uh, you know, we primarily try and promote the behavior. But overall, for me, it's clear that physical activity has a strong role to, to be played as we try to promote physical, but more importantly, mental and social health moving forward. But then the final part um, of, of the, the, the presentation is just to think, well, if we accept those things, what actually can we do to practically support people to be more active? And does it matter what activities we're recommending? Well, I think, I think that it does. I think if, if your job is to promote physical activity, it's really important to think about the specific activities and whether they're meaningful and they resonate with the populations that you're working with. For a really long time, we've been fighting this idea that physical activity is gym-based or lycra-based and involves pain and sweating. And I think we need to understand that many people have these perceptions and how, how is our support and our messaging going to address this? Um, and are we able to you know, come up with a, a series of recommendations that, like Nanette says, help people to sit less and move more in an enjoyable way? I believe it, can, it means considering people's motivations and that people will have different motivations and multiple motivations to be physically active. And similarly, people will have a list of demotivations if we get our recommendations and our messaging wrong. Ultimately, are we able to, to you know, focus on things like happiness that might be the key hook for populations to be more active and enjoy the benefits that we've spoken about? As Nanette said, the Chief Medical Officer's updated guidelines last year emphasizes that idea that some is good and more is better. But can we move away from suggesting thresholds that might be unattainable, especially for the populations we think might be stand most to gain, and focus more on this idea that anything is good? We know that there's no silver bullet, and actually what we need is a coherent set of um, actions and approaches across multiple settings and sectors. Um, and also, it's um, so the Movement for Health is being launched next month, which is a coalition of charities that work with people with long term conditions, um, disabilities and chronic illnesses. And again, are we able to support these crucial populations, some of whom may, may be shielding or, or similar, uh, to be more active? And finally, just to emphasize that there's really good evidence on how to do behavior change and that we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but rather build on all of the known approaches that have effectiveness and efficacy. So simple messages um, that are realistic and relevant to the lives that people are living. Um, and I think that would be crucial to, to, to physical activity's role to addressing the health and social uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks very much for listening. I'm very happy to take um, any questions or follow up on anything that came up that you'd like to know more about. Um, and I'm happy now to hand over to my colleague, uh, Claire, um, who's going to give the final presentation. Thank you very much, Paul. Super. So over to you, Claire. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Can you put it on um, slideshow, Claire, because it's still on the... Um... Is that it now, Linda? No, it's just on, uh, it's not that important because we can see that, that's better, there you go, got it. Okay, great, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just going to finish up today um, by speaking a little bit about um, the time that we spend in sedentary behaviour setting um, and thinking about how this might impact our health. Um, and as Nanette said, um, this is a key part of our physical activity recommendations within the UK, um, but it's often a neglected part. Um, so I think it's quite important just to spend a few minutes thinking about this particular behaviour. So what do we mean by this term sedentary behaviours? And we use this term to think about any waking behaviours that we do across the day and um, where we're in a sitting, reclining or lying posture and our energy expenditure is otherwise low. Um, so the images show you know, some common examples that we might be doing each day. Um, sitting on the sofa to watch the TV, driving a car, using a computer, kids gaming, um, or sitting to socialise with friends and family. And it's important that we think about this behaviour um, separately from the time that we spend in moderate to vigorous physical activity. 
So we could have an individual who is achieving the physical activity guidelines, um, but actually has quite a lot of sitting across their day um, or vice versa. So it is important to think about this behaviour in its own right. Um, and I think, um, as Paul said, we have had a very large body of literature um, looking at the health impact of the time that we spend in moderate or vigorous activity. But in recent years, there has been a growing interest um, in this time that we spend sedentary. And that's really because of how prolific and common this behaviour is in modern societies. Um, but also because of a growing body of evidence linking the time that we spend sedentary with poor health outcomes. So in terms of how COVID-19 has impacted the time that we spend in these sedentary behaviours, that will emerge from UK and international data sets um, in the coming months. But we would certainly hypothesise that working from home, homeschooling, um, shielding, avoiding unnecessary trips um, outside the home, all have the potential um, to increase the time that we spend sedentary, and in particular, potentially screen-based sedentary behaviours. Um, and I think as we, certainly in the UK, as we transition now into the autumn and winter months and potentially spend more time indoors, it's quite a good time for us all to reflect on this behaviour um, and think about whether we might need to modify it. So the time that we spend, spend in sedentary behaviours has been linked to mental and physical health outcomes. And the US report that Nanette has included within her presentation, they included a very strong statement that the public health impact of the time that we spend sedentary is likely to be substantial. So we now have strong evidence um, of the relationship between higher levels of sedentary behaviours um, and increased risk of all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality and an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And the strongest risk estimates do seem to be around um, type 2 diabetes. Um, with recent meta-analytical data um, presenting a hazard ratio of 1.91 um, when individuals were sitting for more than eight hours per day. So that's essentially suggesting that that level of sitting is almost doubling the risk of developing type 2 diabetes in comparison to people that sit less. With more moderate evidence around um, links between higher levels of sedentary behaviours and certain types of cancer, um, and more limited evidence around mortality um, from cancer and also weight status. And it does seem that these health effects of sedentary behaviours are evident even after we control for the time that people spend in moderate to vigorous physical activity. So what we're now seeing from meta-analytical data is that in order to attenuate or eliminate the increased risk of mortality, from higher levels of sedentary behaviour, a relatively high level of physical activity, so somewhere in the range of 60 to 75 minutes of moderate activity each day, um, has been suggested from one meta-analysis. And that's certainly a level of physical activity that would be beyond um, the reach of most people in the population. In terms of a threshold for how much sitting is okay um, and how much sitting um, is particularly bad, um, when we were updating the physical activity guidelines in the UK um, last year, there was a hesitation about being too prescriptive at this stage. Um, but I would say on the basis of the current evidence um, and expert international opinion, there does seem to be an increased risk um, above um, in the range of seven to eight hours per day of sedentary behaviour. And I think as Paul's already alluded to, um, particularly in relation to COVID-19, um, it's important to think about how these behaviours might influence um, mental health. Um, and for sedentary behaviours in particular, there does seem to be an increased risk for anxiety, depression and sleep disorders. Um, and individuals that have higher levels of sedentary time and also potential for lower levels of emotional well-being. 
But the good news is that we can do something to modify this behaviour. And what we're seeing from the current experimental evidence um, is that regular short breaks in activity throughout the day to try and break up prolonged uninterrupted bouts of sitting have the potential to elicit health improvement. And in terms of our UK physical activity guidelines, um, the text that's specifically about sedentary behaviour um, recommends that we minimise the amount of time spent being sedentary and when physically possible, break up long periods of inactivity with at least light physical activity. So the next thing people want to know is, well, how often do you want me to move and what, you know, what is it you actually want me to do? Um, and again, I would say with these updated guidelines, um, on the basis of the current um, empirical evidence, there was a reluctance to be too prescriptive again. Um, but the evidence that we currently have would support um, moving around about twice an hour. So every 30 minutes, if we can move for a couple of minutes that should be sufficient. So just to finish up, um, my take home message um, as we transition into the autumn and winter um, is to try and avoid sitting for long periods. Um, and as a physio friend once said to me, um, the best posture is the next posture. And I think we don't want to demonize all sitting and we're certainly not recommending that people need to be on their feet or on the go all the time. But try and think about how you could modify your posture during the day to avoid long periods of sitting. So some of the things we think about, um, you know, if you're talking on the telephone, could you stand? Could you walk about um, on the video call? So if you're on a Zoom meeting, um, could you be standing? Um, could you potentially use the chair to do some heel raises, some small squats? Um, can you get some movement into that hourly meeting? Um, one of the things our research participants talk to us quite a lot about um, is the importance of cooking from scratch. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is get some movement into all parts of the day. Um, and often that evening time can be quite challenging. Um, so, you know, using cooking, moving about the kitchen, taking stuff out of the cupboard, chopping vegetables, moving to the cooker, all of that movement is good and helps to break up our sitting. Um, even a small walk um, out in the garden, round the block, walk up and down the stairs, do some stretches, all of that is good during the day. Um, our research participants talk to us a lot about pottering about, um, so thinking about ways that you can um, spread movement, so watering plants, um, tidying up your post, for example, clearing out the dishwasher, try and spread those opportunities for movement um, and avoid long, prolonged, um, uninterrupted sitting. And I think finally, um, try and think about prompts that you could potentially use. Um, so commercial breaks might be a bit outdated, but you know, can you move at the end of an episode if you're watching a program on the television? Um, or could you think about potentially using a timer um, or a fitness tracker um, to remind you to move during the day. So that might be a timer on your computer um, or it might be a timer that you have set up in the home. Um, but think about how you could use technology um, to support you um, to try and monitor and modify this behaviour. So I've put some references in at the end um, to support what I've spoken about today um, and I'm very happy to take any questions or for people to contact me after the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much Claire, that was great, super. So speakers if you wouldn't mind including Nanette just turning your videos back on that would be great. So loads of questions here, no way we're going to get through them in 10 minutes, but I'll give it my best shot in terms of grouping them. So um, Seb, if we'll start with you and, and Nanette, do feel free to chip in at any point because obviously these questions are directed at the three main speakers. Um, so one question which I think is really interesting, in fact I'm just going to ask you two questions together, is about the timelines for protective effects. So somebody asked, for example, if you're very physically active as a child, does that build up your immune response when you're an adult? I think I know the answer to that, but I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Um, and then there's a couple of questions on the flu vaccine, actually. 
and common colds and flu. So we're wondering if some of your uh, research, the meta-analysis, the systematic review might be um, relevant for messaging around the flu vaccination campaign set, particularly your findings on vaccination. Um, and just linked to that, somebody else asked, does exercise 150 minutes, et cetera, reduce any symptoms of common colds or flu without vaccination? So sorry, that's three questions, over to you. Okay, so the first question around the timeline, uh, at least the evidence we have been able to unearth doesn't say anything about this. So we didn't find any uh, kind of longitudinal study that would be like life course kind of type of evidence. So I can't tell you that. What we know is from the prospective studies is that the follow-up time was around 10 years immediate. So we can say that there's a protective effect of, of, of 10 years, provided that you, you stay at the same activity level throughout this period of time. There's a corollary to this question is, actually, we know that the, 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 the exercise in the RCT was around eight weeks of training. Does it take eight weeks for, for the immune system markers uh, benefits to kick in? Again, that's something we could not answer. We found studies between five to 12 weeks of training. So all we can do for certainty is five weeks is a minimum, but uh, our feeling, our gut feeling is that the effect is, is, is quicker than this. But I, I have no evidence to support this. And then uh, the effect of vaccination on flu, actually all the studies that we included there were based on uh, immunization on flu vaccines. Okay, great. So that is true there. Uh, and there's no reason I think to think that it would be different for different type of immunization uh, in that respect. And the last question, sorry, I've forgotten now, uh, would, it be, would it be protective against, against the common flu? Yeah, it was. I, imagine, I imagine so as well. Uh, there's a corollary to this, is there is an element of research that says specifically in elite athletes, I say that there's a window of opportunity for uh, infection to happen shortly after exercise training. There's been a, a lot, actually the, the, biggest, the biggest body of evidence is around that, uh, is around elite athletes and the, the risk of being uh, infected just after exercise. And although we didn't review that specifically, we eliminated that, we still read it. And the, 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 the common belief at the moment is that this window of opportunity doesn't exist. Actually, there isn't no such thing as a suppression of the immune system just after exercise. Okay, very important point there. And actually that related to a point that Richard Simpson raised about elite athletes. Okay, uh, a few questions for you, Paul. Again, I'll group them. This is a question from Richard Simpson who refers to the research we've just seen from guys in people, guys hospital in people with post ICU syndrome. Um, so he's asking about the role of physical activity in rehabilitation for those who've had, you know, post PST ventilation, for example. Um, and then an, a really interesting question around grief and the loss of a loved one and what role physical activity might have in recovery. Cause we obviously we're not just talking about COVID patients here. We'll be talking about the populations that have been affected by that. There's other questions for you, but I'll just stick with those two for now. Thanks Linda. Um, great questions. So for the first one, I think, as I said, stated in, in the presentation, I, I'm, I'm not going to claim to be an expert in the, you know, the pulmonary and, and cardiorespiratory physiology of um, post ventilation. The, the evidence is clear that physical activity is a, a highly effective rehabilitation strategy for, for a number, a very high number of, of conditions. So a, a reasonable assumption is that it, it will be an important part of any rehabilitation strategy. Uh, managing the deconditioning um, and as I said you know crucially helping these people um, regain a sense of social and mental well-being. Um, important to note that you know post-viral fatigue is one of the conditions where the evidence for physical activity is is not included in the chief medical officer guidelines so I, I do think it's going to be a, a research priority and be something for clinicians to use their expert judgment on as, as we learn more. The, the second question, I saw that one come in and it, and it got me thinking, and I think it's a really nice example of how any COVID response has to be multidisciplinary, because I know nothing about grief. I'm not a grief researcher or grief, grief expert. So 
So it would have to be a collaboration with people who understood the process of managing grief. And, and that might be, uh, you know, psychologists. I know Nanette's a, a chartered psychologist. And, you know, so there might be people with those interdisciplinary skills, or it may be a collaboration where, you know, the, the, the fields come together to, to address these kind of multifaceted and, and complex challenges. Do you want to add to that, Nanette, before I ask a few questions of Claire? Yeah, very, very briefly. Yes, I think the grief response is a very interesting question. And of course, grief hits us in all levels. And I'm quite sure that physical activity can play a role to help us return slightly towards the outside world. And we know very well from other research that being outside, being near, open and green spaces has its own link to well-being, its own link to nature. So walking briefly with others where it's allowed and getting yourself outside into our natural world may be one route to help people overcome those grief symptoms. Great. Seb, you wanted to add something? Yes. I just wanted to add to the question about recovery in ICU. There's actually really good uh, evidence now that very, very early movement and physical activity is really beneficial on any kind of outcomes from ICU. There's been many trials conducted around people that are even unconscious but are mobilized. And actually the outcome of, of that are extremely beneficial. Good, okay, that's great. And Claire, um, I'll come back if I can at the end for one general question. Um, two questions for you. The first one's actually from me. A number of countries, including initially here in the, in the uh, response to COVID, the guidance was go outside a day once a day to exercise, which I completely didn't follow because I'd leave the house and walk around the block and then come back in again, which is the kind of thing you're talking about. But in theory, I shouldn't have been doing that. So is that counterproductive, that type of rule? is the first question. And the second one, which is really interesting, somebody says, well, lots of people don't want to believe the evidence on hand washing or the use of face coverings in relation to COVID. Um, so how can we try to suggest physical activity uh, or reducing sedentary of behavior to the population? You know, what would you guys recommend in terms of communicating that given some of the caution around other general public health messaging? Great, thank you. Um, I guess for the first question, um, Linda, um, that you've posed, it's definitely with the sedentary literature, the regular movement throughout the day um, and, you know, the, the um, prolonged uninterrupted sitting events um, seem to be the most damaging for health. So if that guideline were to be retained that you can only go outside the home once per day, then that would be one opportunity for movement. Um, but the other opportunities, if we're trying to get people to move every 30 minutes, then we would need to emphasize strategies that people can do that within the home. Um, but yes, potentially um, allowing people to have short bouts of activity outside um, would be beneficial. But I'm aware that that is a difficult message and would bring additional risks in other ways. Um, so I guess it's about the messaging that we would give to people around that. Um, and your second point around um, using this as a public health message and you know the, the wariness that people have with other um, elements of the messaging around COVID. Um, I think the, the opportunities that we have at the minute with physical activity, as Nanette said, we've never had um, such high profile um, political support for exercise and physical activity. I think as a field, we need to capitalize on that um, and to do that in a way that um, doesn't counteract, like I wouldn't like to be saying to people, do this instead of that. Um, but I think we have an opportunity now, like physical activity and exercise, most people in the population are aware of the benefits. Um, and we can use that existing evidence base and existing support and build on it. Um, within COVID um, and it shouldn't be a new message but we're tailoring it to the current pandemic. Great well we've run out of time. I think that was an excellent place to end. There's quite a few questions I haven't had a chance to ask so we'll check if people want us to email them. So uh, colleagues that was brilliant. I really hope this paper will be published. I, I'm happy to assist with lobbying the journal editors because I really think um, I think this is a, a, an opportune moment to get this out and um, I know that our policy colleagues who have this fed back will be taking it very seriously. So I thought that was 
in a in a challenging week, a challenging time for everybody, there was some really good news in that uh, webinar, and I was delighted that you were able to give it. So thank you again. Um, so if, speakers, if you just want to stay on the line, I'm just going to flag the next webinar, um, and then we'll close. So um, as I mentioned last time, we had one. I'm delighted that my a colleague from Iceland will be joining us, uh, Kari Stefansson, who is a geneticist and um, has published a recent excellent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at a large portion of the Icelandic population. So he'll talk about um, the response in Iceland generally, and also just the spread of the virus in Iceland. So do join us on Thursday, the 8th of October at 2 p.m. Um, and then I'm anticipating there'll be a, another webinar after that, probably towards the end of October. We'll be able to say more about that next time. So thank you very much to everybody again. Um, you'll see the Usher comms tweeting the link to the YouTube recording and the slides. Please do disseminate that. I'm confident there's many more people who weren't able to join us who'd be interested in this. So thank you again to all our speakers and we'll close the live stream now.